and we are live. Hello there, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Omar Metab. Uh, I am a reporter and producer for BBC Click. Uh, and I do a little bit of photography and filming myself as well as part of my day job. Uh, and welcome to another edition of Create the Space. This is the eighth in a series of panel discussions about football's social purpose. So until the end of March, the National Football Museum, I will, uh, the National Football Museum itself uh, will be uh, hosting a ret uh, retrospective of the work of the brilliant Sefton Samuels, whose gritty and revealing images offer an insight into the working class life. Uh, post-industrial decline and a football across the 60s, 70s and 80s. So with that in mind, the National Football Museum wanted to bring together a panel of expert voices to discuss football, photography and how the two can be brought together to reflect cultural identity. Uh, by the way, if anyone has got any questions, feel free to write them down. Um, we can see them in our bottom right hand corner. Uh, and later on this evening, hopefully we'll try and dedicate 10 minutes uh, to a little Q&A session. So whoever you want to ask a question to, happily answer them um but we'll save that towards the end of the <clears> discussion <throat> for now i'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves and their practice so starting with abby uh would you kick us off please hiya um my name is abby i'm a freelance photographer from hull um i'm not a football photographer as such um i have worked on a couple of football related projects in the past and worked with some grassroots football clubs but i mainly spend my time photographing live music now um, so I do think there's a little bit of a crossover between sports photography and football photo um, music photography. Um, yeah, so I might be able to bring a slightly different angle to that. I also worked at the National Football Museum for four years, so um, I've got knowledge from that side of things as well. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. It's amazing. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sophie, up next. Um, I, basically, I'm the person that know, know, knows when to press that little button there. That's, that's the only thing you need to know. Um, I I was the club photographer for AFC Bournemouth from the bottom of League One all the way up to, to the giddy heights of the Premier League. Um, and I transitioned from male to female just as we got promoted to, to the Premier League. Um, I retired from photography in 2017 to become a politician, which I've now stepped away from because actually... It's it's a lot nastier and dirtier than football, um, and um, so yeah, I do music photography as well. Plus, the majority of the photography that I do now is based around the other work that I do, which is mental health and equality and diversity. And I do a lot of work with fans for diversity, which is a, a, a great way to be involved with lots of clubs and to, to just capture the amazing people that that basically make up our game. I love that. Really getting involved. I love that. Um, Joe, you're up next. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Joe. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm club photographer at Peterborough United. Um, I've been here for 17 years now and um, obviously cover everything that goes on within a football club, which is outside of that Saturday, three o'clock. Um, it involves that's so obviously like the women's team and the academy and the youth team and the work that the foundation doing the community um and some commercial stuff as well so a bit of everything really yeah. okay. fantastic and last up is um zoe hi um i'm zoe i'm the uh, substitute off the bench tonight for uh, uh the previous uh really advertised jackie mccassey and um, but i work with jackie mccassey on her girl fans project which is a football fanzine documenting female supporters and it's been going since 2013. Um, I work as a designer now predominantly but I still do uh, photography. I started my career as a club photographer at my local club which was uh, Berry Football Club. That's now Berry AFC which is a fan-run club. Um, in 2019 I curated an exhibition to celebrate the 134 year history of my football club, Berry, um, after it was expelled from the Football League. Um, but what was really important about that was it was focused on the role of football and the football club in the community. So it was all about telling the fans' stories. And that's something that's really important to me in all of the work that I do, which is telling the story of the fans. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, let's kick it off with. Um looking at first the personality 
behind the players and supporters. So when it comes to match day or, you know, even outside of it, obviously football is part of a major part of our normal lives. Uh, I know if my team Arsenal lose, uh, I'm angry for days. Um, but how do you use... You must um... be angry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, I, I like to say that um, I'm able to calm myself down, but I haven't found the fingers yet to really, you know, mellow me out. So, um, but... <laughs> Oh, God, uh, especially after this transfer window. <laughs> anyway, um, photography is something which I found, you know, particularly interesting, you know, in a variety of mediums and genres, uh, because it can capture moments and personality and emotions. So when it comes to players and supporters, how do you use photography to capture that personality and to, to tell people's stories? Um, if we can start off with Joe, um, it'd be great. Yeah, so, um, well, being um, a, a club photographer, you're sort of like in and around like the players day in day out and you kind of like just I think I'm there that much they probably don't know I'm there if, if you know what I mean and they just feel I think in, yeah in terms of like capturing like the players personalities is it all just comes with trust I think and just making sh them feeling comfortable in their own environment um and I've always found like just little things like in the canteen in the mornings just saying good morning asking them how the kids are the families um, and it just sort of becomes sort of natural then. And then it, it sort of like pick the camera up and it's all like, oh, smiles here and smiles there. And, and I think that's when you can really capture the, like the personalities and the character. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, no, I mean, um, depending on how clubs go, I guess whether you're um, someone like Zoe capturing Burry's journey or someone like Sophie capturing Bournemouth, you've got two opposite ends of the scale. So, Sophie, what was it like capturing uh, the elation and the emotions of both the players and the fans as they climbed up to the Premier League? Well, the thing is, when, when I joined the club, like I say, we were bottom of League One. Um, I joined the club as club photographer at the same time that Eddie Howe came back from Burnley. Um, and realistically, at that moment, we were looking at relegation down to League Two. Uh, and basically, over the next five years, just to see the way that, that Eddie Howe just managed to lift, lift the team, lift the club and lift the entire town. Um, mm. Right up to, I mean, obviously, we had two promotions on, on the way to the Premier League. But I'll never forget the, the, the game where, where we got promoted. Well... We got promoted at home against Bolton, but then the final match of the season, we were away at Charlton, uh, the Valley, and it was it was just such an amazing experience because I think Bournemouth fans had taken over about half of the Valley, and and it was between us and Watford, uh, and at one point Watford were going to win the championship, and then they let in a goal to Sheffield Wednesday, I think, or something, and then we scored. And I'm there on the touchline taking photos, and all of a sudden you hear this roar go up around the fans as they are obviously checking all the scores. But it was it was just such an amazing thing for for a club like Bournemouth, where only a few years earlier we'd been in the town square with buckets collecting coins to try and stop the club from going out of business. For us to be there on the on the verge of the Premier League was just an amazing experience, and obviously for me it was my last game with the club as Steve. And um, yeah, I, I was about to drop a massive bombshell on them during the summer, but it was just something that I, I never thought a club like Bournemouth would go through. So it's it's always great when you see a, a small club do it. And I live in Brighton now, and when, when they got promoted, it's it's the same thing. Uh, but for me, clubs like Bury, just just the, the the love and support that you get within the game, where in adversity we all come together i think that's that's one of the things that that makes makes the game just so beautiful mm. would you say that's the case zoe uh what, what yeah. kind of stories have you captured over the years yeah i just got goosebumps then because even talking about it it's it's one of the best things that happened in a horrible situation it is like it was amazing how you know fans from all over just rallied to sort of a big outpouring of like shared grief. Um, and I'm sort of repeating a little bit um, what's been said, but I definitely think there's a trust there that you have to build up. I think that's really important. And I, either if you're photographing somebody, say like I do for the fanzine, which is like, we'll go to different football clubs and you've got to establish that trust very quickly because it's just, you're walking up to someone, you're doing it in the moment. Or at a football club, if you've been there for a long time, 
you can you, you do kind of end up becoming invisible in a nice way and um i suppose one of the challenges is uh, as a fan as well uh, a lot of the time when you're photographing um on the pitch you're facing one way and you think oh, i really i need two cameras one i need eyes in the back of my head as well um and then you'll you know face the crowd i think that the times when really I want my eyes as a fan on the pitch, you know, if there's like a penalty moment or, you know, a crucial, uh, you know, crucial moment happening um, and you turn around to look at the fans and you've just kind of like lived the moment looking at them <laughs> um, and you don't know what's going to happen and you react reacting off them. And that's, that's a really special thing. Um, and you get a lot from that and it's, uh, it's a very privileged position to be in watching that raw emotion, particularly of the fans. Mm. Um, yeah, sort of embedding yourself in there. I almost feel it's a bit like when you were at a gig. I don't know, I've not worked in music photography. Um, I did at the beginning of my career, but being in sort of that pit at the front, if you get in with the fans at a football match, um, it's quite rowdy. <laughs> um, but the best thing is, yeah, you've kind of got to become invisible. Um, and you get the best pictures that way. Is that what it's I've like? I've had um, a lot uh, less beer thrown on me at football matches than I have at gigs. <laughs> that is a very good point, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call it beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, would you say that's the case, Abby? Well, how, you obviously worked across both the, you know, music and football. Is there similarities there? What would you say is probably unique to football that you, that you capture that you wouldn't find in any other subculture? I think there's definitely similarities yeah there's a lot of elements that are very similar and you can't quite it's yeah if I was to work in both industries like at the same time I think you would definitely see those similarities like capturing the atmosphere and the kind of yeah just promoting it as like an inclusive space where people can go and have fun um I think with football it's kind of different because you've well, from my experience, I've grown up as a whole City fan. Like, that is what I was... I was never allowed to be a fan of any other football club. That was me. Like, that's my kind of identity as a football fan. Whereas with music, you kind of sway probably in between a few different artists who you really love or genres or, and things like that. But I think with sport and football, it's it's that passion kind of your team that's you'd never ever change like that is part of your identity and I think that's the difference okay um I mean something that then we can probably all relate to whether it's football or other you know um areas is um there's a huge aspect of commercialization especially with the game nowadays um and that's something which I find personally a little bit off-putting you know when you see players um, with their really bad acting uh, decide to say this is the latest head and shoulders or or whatever it may be um, but obviously you try and break beyond that and you try and really you know get to the crux of what makes a player take and you know what goes on behind the curtain would you say it's made more difficult now because of the commercial world of football uh, what challenges do you typically face You want me to say that, having yeah, worked okay. in the Premier League, yeah. which is, which is, let's face it, the big commercial <laughs> blur. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for, okay. for me, the, 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 the best time that I ever had in football was in League One. League One and Championship, it was great. You could get in there, you could do what you wanted. As soon as you get to the Premier League, basically, the, the game's run by Sky. They're there. They've got they've got a, a, a match manager there who who's timing everything for, for the live broadcast and the rest of it. And in some ways, that I mean, let's face it, the Premier League has caused so much money to come into the game, and I, I know some of that filters down down to the lower leagues, and and it does make a difference. But it's also just such such a massive thing and it, it affects it just changes the, the character of the clubs um not always for the better i would say but it, it's a very different proposition being in the premier league even at the bottom of the premier league to to being in any of the other um efl uh, leagues mm. but but I, I think the thing is that sort of one of the things that i i always thought about sort of the, the commercial aspect of it and and the fact that so you'll get players, they'll come in, they'll, you'll try and flog stuff with them. 
Um, see, a player will come in and they'll be with you for a season or two. But for me, fans are there for gen- multi generations. So that's the difference for me. The heart and soul of a football club is the fans because, like, I remember going to Turf Moor and they've still got the the wooden seats in the main stand, and I. I ended up taking photos of these wooden seats purely because I thought, how many generations of bums have sat on those seats watching watching their team? And and you just don't get that with, with players. Players are here for a couple of seasons. I mean, the players that stick around for, for most of their career, you then can't get rid of after they finish their career. Um, they tend to have stands named after them and all that sort of stuff. But there's a very real difference to, I think, the, the relationship between clubs and fans and clubs and players. Uh, mm. and, and I think a lot of that's down to the commercial aspect of the game. Okay. Um, well, what about you got your guys' thoughts? Joe, what do you think? Do you think that there's a, a bit of a disconnect as well? Um, yes and no, I think. Yeah, I think like well, I've done many sort of like commercial shoots over the years. I mean, not quite on the scale of like Premier League. Um, but uh, it'd be st- I think mean, it's just about trying to make it like engaging with the supporters, so we're making it fun for the the players, and like like we said, like it can be a bit boring and it can be a bit staged, and it's just a case of like it comes with with knowing the players. You know which players would be right to do certain commercial bits, and uh, different players are like some players are like really good with kids, and so they they can be really engaging for the younger audience, and then some are a bit more mature and a bit more sort of like like focused and that, that are better for the, the commercial one. So I think it's just a case of just that knowing what, how to engage it really. Hmm. Well, what about the day itself? You know, it's, it's match day, things are lively, you know, kickoffs about to happen. The mood's really drawing up or, you know, depending on how your team is doing anyway. Um, but I imagine then, you know, with the hustle and bustle, whether it be what's happening on the pitch or off of it, it must be quite difficult to capture um, all of those things going on. Uh, what, what would you say are the biggest challenges or distractions on a match day when it comes to um, taking fo- uh, photos? How about you, Zoe? What do you think? Yeah, I don't mind sort of like following on as well from what you were saying before. Um, so it's interesting. So for girl fans, as going doing that project as a zine, going to each, you know, and a lot of clubs we've been to um, are. You know the big the big premier premiership clubs and um that's been really interesting because to to sort of sophie's point the fans the fans are just as amazing whichever level that you are at you know um and i'll sort of say here like i went to photograph man city and we did a fanzine about man city and the fans were just incredible um but then i've been on the other side where you know the you know, again, to Sophie's point, the distance that you have with commercialization of things. So it's, you know, you just cannot get physically in a space. You're not allowed. Your pass won't allow you. Whereas if you're in uh, sort of the lower leagues, you've got a freedom to roam. Um, so that's a, a lot more difficult. And I think as well, you know, it's like the challenge with lots of photography. There's like a suspicion there as well sometimes about, you know, why are you photographing me? Um, and you know some people can get defensive and um you know but that only you only really seem to get that as well like in sort of more that commercial environment and it's not really necessarily the fans it's the stewards and people you know you can't do that and you're not allowed here and 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 that's that does affect the atmosphere it really does but the way that sort of Jackie and I have captured it is go in the fan zones, go around, you know, we we spend sort of those hours pre-match because there's so much that goes on before a football match. It's not those 90 minutes, you know, um, it's everything around it. And I know, like you say, during the week, but those hours, the countdown to like the classic 3 p.m. kickoff is uh, is glorious. Even if it's chucking it down, people will still be standing around outside. They still go to the same haunts and they meet the same pals and, you know, there's a there's a routine there. There's a real ritual around it, and those are things to capture as well. So, well outside the stadium, you know, the chip shop down the road, 
and the woman that runs the chip shop, you know, and those are, those are the other things that go on that you don't even get on telly. I think, you know, Sky doesn't capture that. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I think you're right there. Um, it's not something you usually see every day, but it's, it's something that you would experience at the very least. Um, and one important thing that I would say is probably, um, you know, coming to the forefront a lot more recently, at least from what I've seen, are the social issues uh, within fans or within football themselves. So as you said, due to commercialization, there's a bit more distance or even football is getting involved in social issues such as Marcus Rashford, for instance, uh, and, and school meals. So how, uh, what, what, are you able to capture these social issues that live within football, within the fans of football? at these match day games or, or aside from it? And what, what issues have you been able to capture? It's up like to me or to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> whoever. Um, Abby, why don't you kick us off? Um, well, I think in terms of football, like going to games, I've probably not been able to capture that from that kind of point of view of everyone else. Um, I did do a project when I was in university um, about um, my relationship with my family regarding Hull City. Like I didn't realise at the time, it was a very personal project to me, but I didn't realise at the time that actually a lot of people related to it and kind of resonated with that routine, like Zoe was just saying, the routine of kind of going to the pub then going to the match and mm -hmm. afterwards chatting about it with all your family and your friends. It's, it's like looking forward to the weekend kind of thing. I didn't quite realise that there were these social kind of issues in that because I just saw it as like a personal project but I think it is things like that that make you realize it, photography can really capture these moments in time um but yeah personally that's kind of my experience of it but I have obviously related to lots of other photographers and photography projects that do capture that probably better than I can um yeah, that's kind of my experience from that. I mean, at the moment, all of the work I do is around the social impact of, of football, whether it's from photography, whether it's writing and speaking, because one of the things that I've found out over the years is that uh, football is a universal language. It, it allows you to go and talk to people from marginalised communities that might not necessarily talk want to talk about LGBT issues or mental health issues or or so many other things, uh, but because you've got this common language of football, it means it opens doors for those conversations. So all of the photography that I actually do around football now is about the social impact that football has on communities because um, I've always believed that football is it, it's the fans. Uh, it's not the 22 people on the pitch. It's it's every single person that is impacted by by the club and by their presence within the community. Because I, I think that's what makes football such a special sport um, in a way that other sports just don't seem to have in this country. And I think a lot of it comes from that, that working class... Uh, sort of three o'clock on a Saturday. It was the only day of the week. You, had a, you, you go watch the footy. Um, I, it, it always amazes me that you'll get footy fans that will go every Saturday and complain about their team. And it's like, if you hate it that much, so it's, you only get two days off a week. Sort of, but but no, football fans love it. And and that's the thing. It's, it's like win, lose, draw. You're still going to be there. And I do a lot of stuff in non-league football as well. And I think that that if anyone hasn't sampled non-league football, they need to get out there this Saturday and try some out because that that's that's the real thing. I mean, like at Whitehawk Football Club in Brighton, we're on the equality officer. Our, our groundsman's in his late seventies and he's been cutting that bit of grass for the last forty odd years. And 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 you've just got people that that just come out on on, on a Tuesday and start painting parts of the ground and things. Like it's that that's what it means to people and that's what what we as photographers can capture and document if if only we look away from from the pitch mm. well, what would you say then sophie is probably the most profound or poignant moment um in regards to social issues maybe being discussed between fans that you've captured what what was what stands out to you in the years of your work i i think that 
for for me, one one of the things that that's been re- really big is, I mean, it's <sighs> football means more more than just that moment. I mean, I I've, I've been lucky enough to photograph uh, some some events that really move me. I mean, obviously promotions are very very emotional, but I remember being at Old Trafford just after George Best passed away. And, and photographing all the tributes there, I've I've photographed the uh, the memorial at Hillsborough. These things where where football fans of multiple clubs come together and show their shared love of something, I, yeah. I think it is always really special. But there's there's one photograph that I took that um, I've just donated to the museum, which for me captures captures the whole essence of of. Um, of what football means to us and it was just a, a candid shot that i took about 15 maybe 20 years ago um in salford keys um of two two nippers playing football in in the middle of the square one's wearing a rooney shirt um and it just really reminds me of how we fall in love with the game and um i i i <laughs> I'm I'm just going to show you a really bad low res version of it on on uh, where's the camera there we go so so basically for me that 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 is that that's football to me uh, that that's like two nippers playing football it really reminds me of like a Lowry and actually the Lowry Museum was directly behind me at the time and it's like five minutes around the corner from Old Trafford for me that's football mm. uh, Premier League's great but. That's where we all fall in love with the game, isn't it? Exactly. On uh, wherever we can play it. Uh, <laughs> on yeah. the Sunday. Jump us the goalposts and all the rest exactly. of it. Exactly. <laughs> it's just when you said 15, 20 years ago and you said Rooney shirt, it just <laughs> reminded me how long ago that was. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about um, you then, Zoe? Because obviously, as you mentioned earlier, your work with the community has been, you know, extensive. Um, is there anything that stands out to you in your work with Barry that you've thought, wow, that this is a particularly profound moment or you know, this is an interaction you wouldn't have seen anywhere else? Yeah, it's hard to sort of pick one, really. And I think <sighs> watching the club go through, I think the most heartbreaking thing, actually, that I'm still experiencing now and um, watching happen is the divisiveness of uh, what's happened to a the fan base so my fan base is currently split and it's heartbreaking and you just want nothing more than just to kind of get everybody to be like come on you know you, you know we've got obviously a club at the moment that um you know we've managed to acquire back the stadium and then there's another set of fans that have obviously worked really hard to build up a, a grassroots club um mm-hmm. and and it's um you know, those are those are the sort of the difficult uh, the difficult things, and but I suppose even like the most profound in a way at the moment that kind of is because of the pandemic. Just before the pandemic, obviously, we didn't know it was going to happen, and the, the timing of it is, you know, it was sort of November, um, November December time of two thousand and nineteen, and I was doing a, a special sort of girl fans project with Jackie um, to kind of capture as many of the female fans that were at Berry at mm. that moment in time when we didn't have a match to go to. We managed to get somebody to let us in, the caretaker to let us into the ground. So it was empty. And um, then in the pandemic, we've lost some of those fans. And um, like the people, the the people that have like come since and said like you know, thank you because you that moment that we created has been like a really lasting memory and it's those sorts of things where you just think like wow it's like really profound that like for some families that being at the ground is like that's their most happy and cher- cherished memories when people have gone and I have people come and telling me that like they've got you know their parents ashes were scattered on the pitch and things and people have got married and then gone and had their you know got married in Berry and then walked down to the football afterwards and 
there's loads of stuff like that and it's that those real stories are the real special things and yeah you know promotion's great don't get me wrong I would say you know one of the best days of my life <laughs> I was I had to phone in sick the next day for work and I, I took a massive <laughs> Uh, a massive, uh, yeah, but I can't say that word, but I'm telling off, and uh, oh, it was worth it, so worth it. Um, that's one of the best moments, and it's the highs and the lows, isn't it? You, you, and you, mm. you're living and breathing. It's that football is such a reflection of um, society and life. You know, mm. it's up and down, and sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, and you know, and, I, and that's why you keep going back. You know, because you do, you just have to, that. That's that is life you don't just go all right I've you know I've had a rubbish day you know you still got to get up tomorrow and do it all again so it's the same thing and that's the the real part of it and I do agree when Sophie was saying you know football could just cut across um the sort of socio-economic band as well um that lots some lots of other sports don't mm. um you know because of this sort of exclusivity of it and even i mean i suppose football does with the money that's involved so, you know if you're a fan of man city and the cost of going to watch that um but i do think there's lots of good initiatives that like do try and encourage you know like the man cities for example you know they will give tickets away to local schools you know and communities and they do make a real effort to bring to bring people in and, and that's that's the important thing i suppose mm. Uh, it's a lot more entwined with our lives than what we uh, tend to realize sometimes. But I, I think you touched upon something, which is um, the pandemic has made us reassess a lot in our lives, whether it be our personal relationships or even things in our life that we may have taken for granted, like going down to uh, the stadium on a Saturday morning. And Joe, maybe you can uh, start off uh, uh, start off here. Um, obviously, you know, at least a year had elapsed before we saw live football again or fans returning to the stadium did you see or notice um a, quite a big difference between the fans you took photos of before the pandemic and after was this there's a sense of relief or w w was everyone just a lot more exuberant as a result what what happened what was their difference oh, we really missed the supporters during the, the pandemic um especially as we got promoted um during the season as well um without supporters, which was a real shame. Um, so yeah, I, I, as soon as we found out that the season was going to be behind closed doors, I put pressure on myself straight away to go like this, hopefully it's not going to happen again. So I, I tried my best to try and capture as much as I can to show obviously that it's behind closed doors. There's no um, players getting temperature checked on the way in and the different red zones and face masks and everything like that. And, um, and I, I bought a book out at the end of the season and I've had some so many lovely comments from supporters and um, had a card in the post from a 70 year old supporter who'd been every game since the last sort of 40, 50 years and said that the book sort of like felt like he was there. And uh, obviously that, that meant a lot to me because obviously trying to capture so, uh, like a piece of history and a piece of moment in time that, um, that hopefully will never happen again. It must have been odd that, um, and I imagine um, for Sophie, for you as well, running all these initiatives or, you know, being involved with so many clubs, um, it, it must have really affected a lot of people who didn't get that connection or, you know, wasn't able to explore in the same way that they were. What was it like for yourself as a photographer then that all of a sudden you had to stop or did you have to stop? Was there something else that was done? Well, for, for me, uh, where, as soon as the pandemic hit, um, because the majority of work that I was doing by this point was uh, mainly campaigning work. So um, all, all of my speaking work stopped. All, all, all of the events that I was going to be speaking at just stopped. So, um, yeah, within 24 hours, every, everything disappeared. W wasn't doing gigs anymore. Wasn't going to football matches anymore. Uh, so it's yeah, for me, the pandemic was what am I going to do to set my life up for the world after the pandemic? Mm. Um, and and it was it was very it was a very difficult time for all of us because I think that in a lot of ways, football is one of the very few outlets that we get emotionally 
where, where we, we can just let ourselves go. I mean, no matter what's going on in your life, if you're in a football ground for that 90 minutes, that is all you think about. You don't think about the fact that you're not paying your bills. You don't think about the fact that, that your partner's cheating on you. You don't think about any of these things. But we, we lost that outlet. And I think so many people were struggling with their mental health at the time in so many other ways. And then on top of it, to lose their one outlet. I, I think that I think it, it had a, a massive effect on on people's sense of community, had a massive effect on people's mental health. And it's just so nice seeing people back in the grounds again now, see, seeing people interacting again. But I think it's still going to take a time for, for us to to move beyond the, the scars that, that the last couple of years will have left on people. Because... Mm. Let's face it, we there were so many things that just felt permanent and solid and, and unchangeable. And within the blink of an eye, it proved they weren't solid and, and permanent. And, and these things could just be taken away from us. So I think it's it's important that, that a lot of the outreach stuff that clubs were doing at the time was important. A lot of the, the media stuff that, that clubs were doing to make sure that, that fans weren't left out. And and then you saw a lot of clubs do, doing uh, great work, like going out and and supporting organisations within their local community whenever they could, that mm. didn't infringe on on COVID rules. But yeah, I I think that it's hopefully it's given football uh, a, a an enhanced sense of of their social responsibility to their communities uh, because. Mm let's face it it's a symbiotic relationship the clubs need the fans the fans need the club and we've got to work together uh especially through difficult times i do hope that's uh unless they can definitely pick up on uh especially mine they fired my mascot during the pandemic come on um abby oh! <laughs> yeah they fired gonosaurus um and then Urzil paid for his wage for a little bit and then he went and then that was it and they no more kind of... I know honestly I, I question the club that I support sometimes uh, <laughs> but um in, in terms of some of the moments that are captured um Abby maybe you could shed some light on this because obviously you've worked with the National Football Museum as well uh for uh, a number of years and and you know your work there what would you say is probably um the most what's the word the most impactful things or perhaps the, uh, the the things that perhaps, you know, we can't see in everyday life that you capture uh, that has uh, worked well with the uh, National Football Museum? It's definitely just the conversations that you have with people, um, not even relating to photography, but the conversations that you have where people just come in and they just want to tell you something that it's amazing. Like there's so many stories and things that I learned just from chatting to people um so I used to deliver like tours around the museum and the things that I learned from other people was crazy like I was telling them things that they didn't know so I was teaching them but they also taught me so many things I can't even think of an example um but just crazy things about their clubs that I would never have known had I not been in that job or having that kind of talk with them in, in that moment um I just think talking to people like you wouldn't necessarily speak to kind of in everyday life um it can teach you so many things um not even just about football and experiences but yeah crazy so many stories that i just kind of learned from chatting to these people um like really young people like young kids who would just tell me a story about the first game they went to or like elderly people or families just kind of sharing their stories and that's what it's all about isn't it like sharing stories and fans and it doesn't matter what team you support either you can mm. still kind of relate to that um yeah so not capturing with photography but i think just them memories that people like to share um mm. yeah i think well it relates back to what sophie said that yeah football is a universal language no matter where you are or as zoe said uh, no matter what socioeconomic group we can all relate and we and that's all we want to do is we want to talk and we want to you know, share how we feel and, and you know relate on some level uh and that is fantastic so wh what about um the rest of you what would you say are probably the most interesting stories that you've heard from people that you've photographed over the years 
or maybe a photograph that tells um, a bigger story uh, than what just meets the eye. Oh, oh, um, uh, one thing to say, um, I remember we played in the playoff final in 2011 and we scored the goal that pretty much like, cemented promotion and um, the celebration ran the opposite way to where I was sat. And just instantly, I remember turning to the crowd and I just found in, these people like just jumping on top of each other. And just for that split second, like it doesn't matter who you are, everyone's just coming together and they're hugging and there's like people kissing each other and everything just like on top of people's shoulders. And uh, it that's stuck with me ever since just that the fact that it doesn't matter where, what they did in their day-to-day -day life that at that moment, everyone was just together and it just, that's, it's magical. Yeah. That's great. Um, Zoe, Sophie. Yeah, I don't mind. I, I think um, capturing some of the stories. I'm, I'm just hurriedly trying to find a photo to show you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was like during the, when I did the, it was called We Are Berry. Um, so I was asking fans um, to share. Oh, have we lost? Have we lost him? Has he disappeared? <laughs> okay, we lost him. I'll carry on. Um, and so um, interviewing uh, fans, and uh, one of the times really I've just started to record fans as well. So, you know, putting um, putting some recording down, photographing them and just letting them talk and filming them. Um, and you just get some amazing, uh, you do get amazing stories, but I think one of the one of the things that I did that I didn't well, a place I didn't expect to get stories, I should say, really, is when I was preparing to do this exhibition, um, uh, we uh, would sort of set up in the local pubs that were near the ground because obviously the ground was shut, um, and I'd say, you know, I'm going to be here between you know like one and three or three and five, and come and bring some artifacts and. Uh, things that you'd like to put in the exhibition um, and there was one lady that brought um, a scrapbook from and you know I hope she doesn't mind me saying I won't name her but she was in her 70s and she brought a scrapbook of, and it was some footballer who was like who who she basically fancied back in the day when she was a young girl and she'd kept <laughs> she'd kept like uh, you know she'd cut and paste you know she's like oh I, I always wanted to marry him but you know we can all dream but she kept this thing and I was just like all these stories that were coming out in the pub like just from and it's so there's definitely something around sort of it's why I got involved then with the National Football Museum because I had not quite realized that that the artifacts around football that when people you know a scarf you get someone's football scarf and you say tell me about this scarf oh and they will just go on to a huge conversation because it's, a, and, and actually when I think about it, I'm the same. The football scarf that I wear for Berry, it's a particular one. I don't get a new one every season. You know, there's a story with it and there's, you know, badges that I've collected and that scarf's traveled with me all over the UK, um, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I definitely think there's something in that as well around um, the storytelling of either people looking back at old photographs or perhaps like the objects that are in those photographs that they, they've kept. I think you're very right about artifacts there because I'm doing a lot of work with fans for diversity at the moment with a, a campaign that we call uh, My Club, My Shirt. And last week I spent two days at Wolverhampton Wanderers. And over the, over the course of two days, I photographed a really diverse range of probably about 20 odd fans. And pretty much every single person came with a different wolf shirt but it's not like they all turned up in this season's shirt there's there's guys to and also the difference in color some of them are like really yellow I, there's shirts that were almost brown uh because because that was the colors they went for at the time but but just just the the way in which football shirts have have this this almost sort of um talismanic this this sort of emotional connection for us it's like it it becomes part of your identity um and i i think that that's that's one of the wonderful things but just um omar you mentioned about photos quickly before before you vanish quickly and i found two photos and, and these for me really capture the emotion this was 2013 when bournemouth 
uh, got promoted to the championship. So the first one is uh, whilst we're waiting for the results to come in, and that's Eddie Howe sat in the change room waiting to find out what the results are. And, and then, then this is like a, ten minutes later, once, once we know we're up, and he's there, <laughs> give Matt Ritchie a big, big hug. But, but for me, it, it's that look, the, the behind the scenes things. It's not the. I mean, obviously, it's great to get the perfect shot of, of the winning goal, but you you want to get the human emotion behind it as well. And for me, that's what documentary photography is. It's, it's about capturing the emotion rather than just the action. Um, and especially since so much of, of football and our relationship with it is emotion based. It's not based on logic. It's based on emotion and the way that, that we our football clubs make us feel, even when they make us feel miserable. But it's about about that, that relationship. I I love that. And you know what? It's it's totally right. Well, me personally anyway, I'm someone who follows our club photographer and the things that I appreciate the most is not uh, the pictures of the players hugging just after they scored a goal. No, it's them in training or in the changing room or even them leaving the, the ground and having a laugh with someone else. Uh, it's it's the most telling thing and, you know, what I strive to find out more about, you know, my, uh, my club's players, not, you know, what they get up to in their personal life or what car they drive or how much money they spend, but rather the kind of person that they are. Because, you know, there are some people that come on the pitch and, you know, totally turn into someone else and off the pitch. They're uh, maybe the nicest person in the world or incredibly impatient. Who knows? But that's what that's what's fascinating. Um, and, and going back to what you said about the wolf shirts. Um, yeah, I've got collections of shirts going back 20 years or so. But football itself, especially over the last 50 years, has change dramatically you know as we said like whether it's commercialization or broadcast or the level of talent or um you know the style of play and what is champion nowadays and as time has gone on would you say that the art of capturing sport through photography has changed as well uh, and what would those changes be over the years would you say but for me the the biggest change would be the commercial aspect of it and the whole idea of uh, rights holders uh, and the fact that the, the 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 pictures are there to fulfill a commercial basis. I mean, the th thing is that idea of documentary photography has always been there. I mean, you look back through the history of photography that there's the 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 pictures that really speak to me from the past. Are, like say the the little behind the scenes documentary ones, like like pictures of the white horse at, at the, the FA Cup final and things like this. Thing, things things that just aren't the obvious. I, I like seeing pictures of the players sat sat in the in the dressing room afterwards, absolutely knackered looking at each other with like the World Cup on the floor and things like this. The, these are the ones that capture the the true emotion of, of the day. And I, I think that those pictures have always been there because great doctors documentary photography will always be great documentary photography regardless of the era that is taken but i just think that nowadays there's a lot more around the commercial aspects and one of the things i made a point of doing when i was club photographer at bournemouth was i was very very particular about my picture editing about which ones are left in i could have the perfect shot of someone about to score a goal but like that, their eyes would be funny, or or there, we had one player that always ran and his hands were like that, and it's like it'd be perfect shot, perfectly in focus. But it's it's like I saw my job as a club photographer to turn them into heroes. That was my job. They were already heroes, but it's like I am there to reinforce that herohood of the players, uh, and I wouldn't let a single picture go out where they had a dodgy face or anything. Because it had to build them up. It had had to had to be be the, the full hero landing Marvel comics thing rather than than the sort of oh I've headed the ball and my face has gone all wonky sort of thing. Uh, but it's amazing how many of those people. I remember I bought my son a match a, a match annual. That's how long ago it was. And and it's like I'm flicking through it in the Stephen Sherrod and all that. I'm going. I'd have rejected that one. I'd have rejected that one. I'd have rejected. That. Because they, they weren't hero photos. 
which I thought was an essential part of the club photographer's role, which isn't a part of the newspaper photographer's role. So it's mm. very, very different the, the way in which the photographer must see the subject. Mm. Well, going straight from that, um, we've actually you know hit the 10 minute mark. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, so we're going to go to a couple of questions. It'll be good to get a quick fire answer from each of you and the reason why. And the one that's uh, got two votes at the moment, which is an interesting one. I'm, I've been thinking about it for the last minute or so as well, what I would pick. Is there a moment from football history that you would have loved to have been there to capture? Good question. It is, isn't it? I would have personally liked to have been there for Pizzagate, uh, like right in the <laughs> tunnel, or uh, Aguero, you know, one of those, you know, just... Um, but what, what about you... Um, how about all you guys? What do you think? I think it's got to be England winning the World Cup, 66. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a given for me, I think. But then also lots and lots of memories as a football fan in general. But I think that is the moment that would have been the kind of perfect one for me personally. Would have just... I, 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 think, I, I think for me, it would have been... George Best playing for United. Like George George Best was literally the best uh, ever. There was just something about him. I, I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times, um, and and annoyingly, I I never took up too much of his time, and because I was I, I was always I always wanted to be respectful, but not take up. And and sort of retrospectively, I found out that if I'd actually started a conversation with him, he'd have probably just been quite happy to chat but uh for me george best was always the one okay what about you zoe i'm not excuse me i've not actually thought about this before but it's genuinely just uh i i know that my uh my granddad was um played football for um sort of uh, Harwich rmi and uh I'd have loved to have, if I could have gone back in time and I could photograph that or photograph my granddad, who used, my other granddad, who used to go and watch at Main Road. Like, so I think it's interesting because I just went straight to like person, the fan, the fan I'd like to sort of, you know, a Main Road's one where I think, oh, I'd love to have known what it was like, like there. And, the, you know, when my granddad used to watch it every week or, you know, what it was like, it, you know, post-war, you know, playing... Uh, in Greater Manchester, so I love that's that. mine. I love that. Uh, are there any pictures of your granddad that do exist? Yeah, just like the club for you know, like the uh, the team photo and the individual yeah. one. Um, and uh, yeah, but I'd love to, you know, you only have those even away, um, unless somebody, you know, there was a documentary photographer. Um, that's yeah. Going back to what you said before, I think now it's it's great. I love that everyone's got the phones out. I know, con controversial opinion, but um, I do like how people are capturing. And I love actually following the game on Instagram. And you have accounts like non-league uh, non dogs. You know, it's like a guy that has an account that's just photographing dogs at non-league games. It's just like, oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I'm, that. that's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what about you, Joe? I think, um, yes, yeah, sticking with the World Cup thing, right? Um, France 98, the World Cup final, that was the first World Cup I, I really, really remember. Like, that was my my happy, happy like, place. You know, at the time, like 98, my childhood with, with my granddad watching the game. And whenever I think of football, that's my first sort of like real memories of football. So would, that, that would have been one. That's the first one that comes into my mind anyway. Mm. I love it. Each moment is you know, attached to some sort of personal preference or personal connection. Like even mine, like if I was answering it seriously, it would have been um, World Cup 2002, England, Brazil, because I was in year six and I was at the Isle of Wight and a whole load of schools were watching on this big projector and we lost and it was a horrible moment, but it was one of the best trips of my life. Uh, and, and I would have loved to even have taken a picture of that projector, God. Um, <laughs> another question that's come in. Um, how do you get your personality into photography, especially during the match, you know, and all the hustle and bustle? I think, um, for me, I think um, it almost just comes with a bit of consistency. I think that's the best way of showing sort of my personality and like my style almost sort of thing is just the consistence sort of, of like the edit and 
um uh, yeah things like that and i always try and try and like different so, do something different whether it be different angle or different sort of shooting position or and yeah i'll just I and mean, then just try and keep the edit as consistent as possible that's probably the the way i try and yeah show my style if that makes sense i don't know <laughs> yeah, it does it does of course it does <laughs> um what about you abby i think quite similar to that as well um as well as trying to capture kind of the thrill and excitement but i think my style has definitely evolved throughout the years and now i kind of i think i bring a lot of color into my images and things like that so i think the goal is to kind of have your pictures but people instantly know that they're yours you know, the way, through the way you edit and the way that you kind of photograph things, people would look at them and kind of be like, yeah, I'll be took that picture or whatever. Um, I think that's kind of where I would go with personality. Mm. And uh, Sophie, Zoe, I imagine it's probably similar for yourselves. And I imagine the sport as well and just working in it for so long has influenced your personality and style as well. Would you say that would be the case? I... I... For me, uh, a big photography influence was always watching movies. Uh, oh. my, my photography was always very cinematic. Um, so, so uh, like I would do things like frame things so that, that things were in different parts of the frame to, to convey different things. And and I've I've always been, uh, I mean when i when i was shooting sports and football uh predominantly obviously i had to have an slr i i, I use nick on stuff but but for me the, the the camera that's always felt most natural to me is a rangefinder and and i'm i'm back to using a rangefinder all the time and it just it's something that just fits in my hand and it it when, when I got this latest one, it's like the camera that my hand was designed for, and it just matches my vision and and my 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 ergonomics and everything perfectly. And and it's actually made me fall back in love with photography again, rather than just using the biggest camera and the biggest lens, like quite often I had to when I was doing football. But but it's I I think that that your camera becomes an extension of you. Mm. And um, and as Zoe was saying, sort of, uh, I I love iPhones. I the best camera is always the one that you've got with you, mm. and and that's the really important thing. If you haven't got your camera with you, you can't take anything. So so yeah, I mean, I I ninety nine percent of the photos I take, I take on this thing, uh, and and you know what, no one would ever know the difference. So it's interesting you listening to it, everyone. So you get paid for the job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's an interesting one. I, um, I suppose it's a slightly different answer. I don't know. I, I suppose other people say that they can tell if it's my photo. I don't really think about it in that a sort of a conscious. I'm not really like make a conscious effort with it to be honest. I don't know if that's because I've like worked almost as well curating other people's work as well yeah. and um i i'm sort of keen to sort of look at sort of the storytelling of and perhaps like combining multiple photographers um but i definitely think and again it's like that on ten it's the thing you can't can never sort of uh you know you say if you could bottle it up and sell it it'd be great but you know it's that when people say what makes a good photo and sometimes you just know and it sounds like a cop out when you say it but <laughs> the only the nearest i can ever get and i know i think everyone sort of said this in their own way is like it it moves you it, you know there's something where you feel passionate about you know it you either you know it provokes a reaction and i always say like if if i show someone a set of photographs and they go oh that's nice that's not the reaction I'm after. I don't want it to be nice. If you say, oh, I really hate that. I really love that. That's what you, you, you want that reaction. You don't want just everything to just feel nice. You know, mm. you don't want it, you know, you don't want everything to be like that. So yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one. I'm sure people 
would say differently about my photos or something but I, yeah it's not something that I'm consciously aware of and it's just yeah whatever camera you've got and capturing that moment that thing that uh yeah that makes no, well, sense it, it does it, well I mean to me personally it just says to me that you're behaving naturally and your, your personality naturally comes out as you work so it's probably better you don't think about it at least I like <laughs> to think that because that's what I do um we are coming up to the end there is one more question I'd like you to all to quickly answer um just because I'm curious myself um there's been some great characters at all of the clubs you've worked with for each panelist who has been your favorite person to photograph Oh, should I go first? It yeah, has well. to be for me at Peterborough, Barry Fry. You, you, you hear him before you see him, and um, so you really have to just half pick up your camera, and it's like, hey, and it's, he just makes everyone laugh, and yeah, it's easy. Whenever we do like sort of corporate stuff, or and he's in there with sponsors or guests, and we're going for a group picture, just as I'm about to press the button, he's like, Let's pretend we won. And then everyone cheers and it just everyone smiles and it's yeah, it's perfect. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, what about you, Sophie? Uh for me it's got to be Eddie Howe. Uh Eddie Howe holds a, a very particular place in my heart because of the amount of support uh that he gave me when I transitioned. But not only that, he's someone that, that gave his all to Bournemouth as a player and as a manager. And and literally took us from obscurity to, to the Premier League. Uh, and I I just think he's one of the nicest people that I've ever met in football. And um, yeah, Eddie Howe, all the way. It's beautiful. I love that. Abby? I don't know. Um, I think because I'm not necessarily a football photographer, I feel like this, I can't relate as much as the others. Um, even I if it's not football, who's who's the favourite person you've ever, um, you know, at a gig or you know in music? I think it's I think it's fans, isn't it? They're the ones who show uh, the kind of that immersion and that connection. Um, yeah, just fans in general. Fans, the Atmos, uh, and Zoe. Yeah, um, for um, for anyone else who won't know, but I'll try and I'll find a picture and post it online after. But Kenny, he's called Kenny. Watched Berry FC all of his life, and. Um, yeah, for any if very fans are listening, they will know. Um, but again, it's that similar thing. Just uh, absolute hero. When it's, you know, some clubs they just like have fans that are completely connected. That you know, the, it wouldn't be a match day if you didn't see Kenny. Um, so yeah, Kenny. <laughs> love that. We all have one of them. I love it. Um, well, I mean, me personally, per motorcycle, but I'm just flexing because I interviewed him recently. So that, that's it. And it was a lovely bloke and he was so warm and it, I loved it. Um, but guys, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate everything that you said. You've been a wonderful panu, a panu? panel. There we go. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for your contributions this evening. Um, to everyone in the audience, please do check out uh, all the work of our photographers. There are links in the, uh, in the little chat on the side, you should, in the comment section on the right, you should see it. And if you get the chance, do come down to see when football was football. Sefton Samuels exhibition at the National Football Museum, uh, which will run until the end of March. That's all from us now, but remember to subscribe to our channel and we'll see you later on in the year for our next Create the Space talk. Thanks again and have a lovely evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye.